Dr. Herlich, Minister Flanagan. I have to mention uh, Charlie Flanagan because he once got me off a speeding charge uh, in this area. <laughs> uh, with a female judge who believed that like death was the proper penalty for speeding through her area, she was a legend in her lifetime. I'm also happy to be here because um, it gives me a chance to tell you very briefly about the last time I stayed the night here, and I hope it'll end up differently this night. It was a good 40 years ago, and I was myself and Seamus Dennis had been in a trusted Gussie O'Connor's pub in Doolan. We were supposed to go there for a day. We were there for a week. We ran out of money. He wrote checks. Gussie O'Connor said, put it back in again until it settles when it came back. Or he told Gussie to put it back in again until it settles when the check came back from the bank. We finally made our way home, very much worse for wear, and we fell asleep. At, we fell asleep at the wheel of the car I was driving. So we stopped at Port Leash and we knocked up a woman who had said she claimed she was got out of the bed and breakfast business. We heard in the grapevine and we realised why. Uh, she gave us a bed for the night, top of the attic. We had a bottle of whiskey between us. We drank it all night. We woke up with the worst hangover we'd ever had in our lives. We couldn't move. We were in the same bed, Seamus Ennis and myself, not a young tour, just that's the way it was then. <laughs> and um, as we woke up at the same time and we couldn't move our heads towards each other, and we, were, we became aware there was a, a window, six inches, a, an attic window from our noses, and a huge church bell was in the upward swing and about to descend and shatter the room and shatter our heads. And that moment of silence, um, Seamus Sennett said to me, Jay Zone, there's times you'll be better off dead. <laughs> and uh, I hope it doesn't end like that tonight. Um, I used to be a great fan of James Fenton Lawler. When I was young, I could recite him. I kept him a hard Republican home. Uh, but of course, like as I get older, um, things get more complicated, and now I'm not such a fan, and I've moved to being, being a fan of his biggest um, <coughs> rival and, um, and he, his, uh, his doppelganger in many ways, Daniel O'Connell. So I want to speak very briefly about... Uh, I learned so much from all the speakers tonight, for once. I'm, I'm a terrible know-all, but I actually really learned a lot, particularly from Regina there. And, um, and uh, I just want to make two points, one about O'Connell and one about the famine, um, or some points about O'Connell. Um, first of all, similarities. O'Connell was an Anglophiliac. We forget that he deeply admired uh, the achievements of Victorian England. He, had not, he hadn't got a, an anti-British bone in his body. He deplored and hated British policy in Ireland, but he, he even had respect for the British Raj. Because like Karl Marx, he understood that in a struggle between feudalism, the feudal aspects of Indian society, which bore down so hard on women and other classes, uh, were in many ways ameliorated by some aspects of the earlier British colonial system. And like Marx, he was willing to acknowledge that. And that came to a head, of course, in his great uh, support for the Royal Navy, Navy in his battle against slavery. The second thing about similarity between uh, that time and ours, I think, is O'Connell... Um, offers us an antidote to the romanticism of Pierce, which we're now going to uh, have to put up with, um, and it's put up in my case, because if you spend your life in that kind of Republican hothouse atmosphere, you become very chary and very concerned about what the results are. And I remember reading Father Shaw back in 1966 and hating everything he wrote. And now when I read Father Shaw and I realize there's a danger unless you control and modify and keep historians in play at all stages of something like 1916, it can end up with a lot of romantic nonsense and a lot of young men going the wrong way as it did, as it did in previous times. The commemoration of 1798 in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in um, 1898 brought my grandfather into the, IR, great, uh, grandfather into the IRB, as indeed 1966 brought many people into the IRA, and we have to watch what happens in 2016. I think the other... Great lesson, though, that O'Connell has for us is that um, is in, in, the, in, a, in a clash that we're now facing between what I would call civilization and culture. I'm talking about the great threat posed across the world by the, a militant ideology like Islamism and the uncertain response from the West. O'Connell was faced with that problem. I remember reading the diary of a British officer, Irish officer, Clonakilty, um, in India, young colonial officer. One day, he was faced with a funeral procession carry a young woman who was drugged. She was going to be burned in the ceremony known as, cultural so, custom known as sati, or sete. She was going to be burned at 60 years of age with her, with, her, with her dead husband. And he was faced with a dilemma because his standing instructions were to not interfere with local customs. But Western civilization or Western values or Christian, Judeo-Christian values were also in place there and warring within them. 
and he finally drew his revolver and saved the girl. Now, O'Connell never hesitated to draw his revolver when faced with a clash between Judeo-Christian values of the, of the importance and dignity of the individual and any regional, national, or religious culture. He was faced with that problem by the Confederacy of the, in, in the United States, who maintained that slavery was a natural, regional, local custom which they were entitled to practice. And O'Connell said, no, you're not. Basically, he's saying the name of Judeo-Christian Western civilization, you're not entitled to have slaves. And he opposed them, and he made common cause with Frederick Douglass. Whereas, in fact, if you note, the Pierce tradition made common cause with John Mitchell, who ended up as a slaver. So the romantic tradition can end up, of the Pierce-Mitchell type can end up in great extremes, and that kind of boring, pragmatic O'Connell tradition can sometimes rise to heroic heights in making a stand. Now, I know all the arguments about multiculturalism, but multiculturalism was presented to O'Connell in the form of the Confederate demands. We have to think very hard about how we're going to react to this, especially in the light of recent demands that the Irish education system, the secular element of it, be adjusted to make room for uh, Islamic culture. I mean, where would that end if that's going to go on? So that resonance from O'Connell's day comes back. I'm sorry to rain on some of the parade and the warm feelings here tonight, but, I, you know, it's not my business to come to confirm, to peop make people happy, or even to make them sad, but to tell you the truth as I see it. And I do think that the multicultural problem, as faced by O'Connell, has lessons for us. Secondly, I think that O'Connell is um, what he calls what Joyce called the big dark figure, is an antidote to the cult of Michael Collins and the cult of Patrick Pierce and the physical force cult. And I think that this is very important given that we are trying to bed down the peace process and we are visited continually by legacy issues of Sinn Féin. We've been watching them all the week in the form of Maria Cahill. There's more legacy issues on the way. Now, some people in this society, Liz O'Donnell recently wrote that it was time to stop bringing Sinn Féin to the coal and stop hounding Sinn Féin. That's for the victims to decide, not for Liz O'Donnell to decide. That's for Ireland to decide, the people of Ireland to decide. So we have a huge problem. The peace process is a very great good, but it's also a very great evil if it causes us to blur our moral values and to want Maria Cahill to go away because it's kind of a problem for the peace process. And again, O'Connell was very clear always on these issues of physical force. And particularly, I want to say here and now, a form of breast-beating, I really want to apologise to his ghost for all the times the young Republican, I smeared him and abused his name for walking away at Clontarf. Only now do I realise that my great hero, the Duke of Wellington, only recently did I discover my great hero, the Duke of Wellington, Hugely admired O'Connell, not because O'Connell, of course, helped to bring in a measure of Catholic emancipation, but what amazed the Duke of Wellington, a disciplinarian so strong that he didn't even like troops to cheer in case because it bordered an anarchy, he thought. <coughs> Wellington, who did not, by the way, say he was born, uh, that he wasn't an Irishman, and that just because you're born in stable didn't make you a horse. He was very proud of being an Irishman. And Wellington was amazed, not that O'Connell um, went to Clontarf, not that he abandoned or left the meeting at Clontarf or called it off. He was amazed that the people obeyed him at Clontarf. That shocked Wellington, the victor of Europe. And that was the strongest example of the moral power of constitutional action. And O'Connell pushed the law to its furthest limits. He wasn't able, like Pierce and Lawler, to be indulging in high Republican rhetoric. He faced sedition charges every time he opened his mouth. He had to be prudent from a sedition point of view with rigged juries and corrupt, cor cor packed courts. But he also had to be careful to keep down the kind of rabid bloodlust that could rise up but had been a man in the Irish society since 1798. He didn't mm -hmm. want it to spill over to, to blood. Get, having said that, he pushed the law to its limits. And that brings me to the quest of the famine. I was struck by a Martha saying, I hope he pronounced his name right, I don't know if I did, Dear Mr. Correctly, send the great uh, Nobel Prize winner, Indian economist. He has no interest in Irish politics, but he's huge interest in quantitative data. He believes the Irish famine was of the same order as the famine that hit the Iceland, Cape Verde, and Finland in the, in the 17, uh, 17 to 1800, 1750, 60, 70, 80, where they lost a third of their population. Sen thought that was quite extraordinary. But again, as Jack O'Connor said, the famine. Um, 
The blame for the famine belonged to a lot of people apart from the British government. The cover-up part was the problem, was the reaction of the British government to the famine. The famine was inevitable. Once Napoleonic wars created a huge demand for food in Ireland, the tenant farmers, the strong farmers, began to grow food. They pl made plenty of money. They hired labourers. They gave the labourers a third of an acre. The labourers had large families. The population boomed. Everybody benefited in that period until the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. That was the end of the, the golden era. And then it was all downhill. But the people were already born. The children were already born. The clock was ticking. It couldn't be stopped. And so we were headed for disaster from 1815 on. And the British government behaved badly. But the grain wasn't grown, you know, by a, a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand uh, landlords. It was grown by tens of thousands of small farmers and farmers and middling farmers and strong farmers. They grew the grain. They exported the grain. There was a huge class content in the famine that's covered up. Huge class struggle involved in the famine. So it's like the economic disaster we've had recently. The blame has to be spread a lot more widely than blaming Fianna Foyle or blaming any group in, the, in, the, in the, our society. Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people played and speculated. We see the collapse of doctors, and, of doctors and judges and others caught by property speculation. A lot of people partied. Maybe you didn't party, but a lot of people partied. So pointing the finger at Bertie Hearn or Brian Cowan or, 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 or people in the Irish Times trying to flog houses, that would wash. It didn't wash in the famine time. The famine blame belongs to a lot of people. The cover-up like the Maria Cal case, it's not the rape, it's the cover-up that did all the damage. It wasn't so much the famine, that blame belonged to a lot of people, but the cover-up belonged to the British government, true enough. And that brings me to the big question, what about, why this incredible passivity? Why were the Irish people so incredibly passive in the teeth of the famine? Well, obviously one big reason is they didn't have a leader any longer like O'Connell. But there's another element. There must be another element. And I think Brendan O'Buckley traced it in his book uh, in his, 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 when he was talking about Ashling Gear. And he cites a poem written after the collapse of the Boyne that warned people away from politics. A clan in the Nyatra of Curigi and Orna is now Curigi Simbrish in the Boyne. A clan of Gael Calma, Winigi and Forshaw is now Curigi Similar Vrist in the Boyne. In other words, he said, get the corn in, lads, and don't mind what happened at the Boyne. Now that's stoical. Passive DNA, I think, is deep within us. I think, far from being a revolutionary people, I think we're a deeply and profoundly constitutional people. And that's good in most ways in my book. But there's a negative side to it too. The positive side was put by uh, the elegant, educated, and aged, uh, wonderful woman, Christine Lagarde. Recently in the Financial Times, she congratulated us. She said she was impressed by how Irish politicians managed to implement tough reforms without trouble. She says, the way the Irish have played this is very clever. Portugal is the same. They've gotten everyone to pull together. But there's a negative side too. It's easy for the wealthy and the connected and insider Ireland to pull together. Stoicism, you know, can be a form of cowardice too. And here, I want to give heartfelt approval to one of the finest traits of James Fintan Lawler. He refused to accept that man is doomed to be a victim of history or an object of history. He believed that men and women were agents of history, responsible for their own destiny. And I believe that's the most important lesson he left us. We don't have to accept what is. We can take life in our hands. We can decide to do it our way. Thank you very much.